Well, good evening. I think most of you know it's been a little bit harder of a weekend for me. The house has been quiet. I think you know that Kate and Freddie have been visiting the Iowa side of the family. And while it's hard to see them go, I'm glad that they are able to spread a little bit of joy uh, up there. But Lord willing, they should be back tomorrow evening and things will be back to normal. But the way I see it, if James can manage for, what, three weeks or however long it is without Bridget, I think I can manage for just a few days. Uh, but it's, it'll be good to see them back. And I have to say, and I don't say this maybe enough, I don't say it every time I think it or else you'd get tired of me saying it, but how much we uh, love the congregation here and value all of you uh, for what you do for us. I'm also thankful, too, for how you provide for the family. And I thank the Lord for that. And one of the things that drives me is that I always try to make sure that you get a spiritual return on the investment that you've made physically in a way that God would be pleased and that you have what you need. For this evening, you might be turning over to Romans chapter 14. That's going to be the focus of our study this evening. If you think about a congregation's possessions... The prized crown jewel of a congregation is unity. Everything is driving toward that. Our understanding of scripture, our good works that we share among one another and in the community, all of it's driving at unity. And that's okay to say because that's precisely the thing that Jesus prayed for, that his people would demonstrate that kind of unity. But has it ever ever struck you It's so ironic that the question of unity, what it is and how unity is achieved, since the time of the first generation of Christians, has been a point of contention. It's been a point of division. It's ironic, but it's probably even more serious than that. That is a work of the evil one. That even amid studies and conversations about unity, what it means to be unified, that we disagree about that. And most especially is that scene with Romans chapter 14. The whole idea and purpose behind the chapter is to bring God's people together into unity and into that kind of fellowship that God wants. And yet, there has been great debate and discussion and a parting of the ways at times over what Romans 14 is saying. So what that means then as God's people, it is necessary for us from time to time to go back to this key text and study what it is that the Spirit is teaching us about unity. More specifically, this chapter is teaching Christians how we are to conduct ourselves when we disagree with one another. But the question is, what kinds of disagreements is this chapter talking about? What do we do then when we have these disagreements? And also very important to our discussions on this chapter with others is what is the chapter not talking about. We want to look at these questions then this evening so that the Spirit's instruction for us can be clearly defined on what we are to accept and what falls beyond the scope of this chapter. So what I want to do first is to look at the background of the congregation at Rome at this time, and maybe we should more properly say the churches at Rome. The letter to the Romans is what we would call a circulatory letter meaning that there were a number of churches in Rome, and you gather that from reading the last chapter, to the church in their house, and then to the church in this house, and these other churches send greetings. There were a lot of churches in Rome, and so it's sent to all of these Christians, and chapter 14 is part of that central message to them. It's important to know in understanding this chapter that the church at Rome was a blend of diversity between Jew and Gentile Christians. And the Jews and the Gentiles who make up this church bring a number of differences to the body of Christ. There are clear cultural and religious differences between them. One you might think of is the matter of diet. You have Jewish Christians there who from the time of the law of Moses all the way even to this time, there are Jewish Christians now that don't eat certain foods and don't eat certain meats. The law forbade them to eat meats, for example, like pork and other kinds of meat. And they have observed this from the very beginning. And they continue as Christians to observe with religious conscientiousness that kind of dietary restriction. On the other hand, you have Gentile Christians who maybe in their former 
idolatrous pagan way of life, may have observed certain days as holy, and even though they certainly do not continue to connect it with their false gods in any kind of respect for these pagan deities, they might still stop and observe a day as holy. And so there are some differences then between these Christians. And there is a further misunderstanding of some of them on God's will on various matters. I want to look at just a couple of examples of this. Some of the Jews still could not fully distinguish in their mind the fact that certain matters of the law of Moses were not things that God bound upon them. We haven't read yet from Romans 14, but put a marker here. Hold your place here, and let's turn over to Colossians chapter 2. We read here that the law of Moses was not to still be binding in its ordinances on anyone, Jew or Gentile. If you look in Colossians chapter 2, notice what's said then in chapter 2 and verse 16. Here the apostle writes, So let no one judge you in food or in drink, or regarding a festival, or a new moon, or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. One of the biggest spiritual battles that the early church had to fight is, do Gentiles have to keep the law of Moses to be saved? And over and over again, consistently, the apostles of Christ and the Spirit-filled church gave the answer, no. Gentile converts do not have to keep the law of Moses. They do not have to be circumcised as a gateway into the kingdom. God does not impose that on anyone. Now, here's an important distinction. However, God never said that Jews have to completely abandon their heritage. If a Jew wants to observe their diet, if they want to observe, observe the Sabbath, as long as they don't do it to impose it on someone else, they can do that. Paul himself participated in some of the parts of the law. And so God didn't say you couldn't do it. You could not bind that on someone else. And so the picture we have here is that there are some Christians in Rome who, when the Sabbath day rolls around, they think to themselves, I cannot bring myself to labor, to go on an extended journey, or do any of the things that for all of our generations we have refrained from doing. They could not bring themselves to abandon that. It was a matter of conscience. On the other hand, there were some Gentiles that were not fully instructed and convinced of the truth that idolatry had no reality behind it. Uh, turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. This is a passage I think for a lot of us is a little bit surprising. But there were some Gentile Christians worshiping in Corinth or at Rome that didn't know an idol wasn't an idol. You go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, notice verse 4. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 4. Therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is no other God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. However, there is not in everyone that knowledge. Now, the everyone here is not just the whole world. Well, that's not a big deal, Paul. <laughs> Obvious. Not everyone who is a brother has that knowledge. For some, with consciousness of the idol... Until now, eat it as a thing offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak. Remember that word. Weak is defiled. The point here of this passage is Paul is saying, look, if you've got some of your Gentile brethren who might see you eating food offered to an idol, and they don't yet understand this, what seems to us an elementary proposition that there's one God in existence. It seems as if some of these Christians have now been converted and they say, our devotion, our discipleship, our allegiance is not up for question. We serve the one true God of heaven and His Son, Jesus Christ. That's not up for debate. But still, there are these other powers that are subordinate to Him and we can't be involved. They don't have this understanding yet. That, that an idol is nothing. And so Paul says, Christian, don't eat meat if that offends your brother. 
and bothers their conscience. So the point that we're trying to make then is that both of these groups, Jew and Gentile, might hold to different beliefs or even convictions, and they don't understand the will of God on that particular matter. And so Romans 14 is teaching Christians how to conduct themselves toward those with whom they disagree on these kinds of topics that we're looking at. And so because some of these Christians might do things that trouble the conscience of another in these matters of liberty, they were to be aware of that. The point that we're making here is anyone of any background could eat pork. But to some Jews, that was unthinkable and that troubled their conscience. Anyone of any background could eat meat sacrificed to an idol or later sold or served. But to some Gentiles, such behavior legitimized paganism and it troubled their conscience. So in this chapter, the Spirit is teaching Christians how to conduct themselves on these kinds of matters. Now let's get a little bit more specific and looking back over here to Romans 14. This chapter is part of Paul's teaching in this letter that begins all the way back in chapter 12. Do you remember that verse? I think most of us could quote that. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice... Holy, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service. And so Paul now has been writing about justification by faith, the mercies of God, forgiveness, even though we are enemies of Christ. And now he is saying, based on God's love and commitment and sacrifice to you, he expects love and commitment and a sacrifice in return. Now, how do I best show God my love for him? One of the ways Paul then proceeds to write is, you show it in your love for one another. So the rest of chapter 12 is using your gifts and abilities to love one another. In chapter 13, we have the commandment, owe no one anything but to love one another, for the law is fulfilled in this one thing, love your neighbor as yourself. And then we come to chapter 14. It's still about loving another. So in this chapter, what is the teaching of Romans 14? There are some terms and some words that are used in this chapter that are crucial for us to understand how Paul means that word before we go further. If you look, for example, to verse 1, Paul says in Romans 14, 1, Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. The terms and definitions that you have to understand, or else you'll miss this chapter and misapply it, are found here in verse 1. The message of Romans 14, and this is so crucial, friends, that you do understand this one point. The message of Romans 14 is directed toward the strong in the faith. We get into all sorts of problems in applying this chapter if we don't understand its message is to the strong ones. Now, what does he mean by the strong ones? Here he says strong in the faith. Now, the word faith here is not the faith that sometimes the New Testament uses the word faith, meaning the entire system of the gospel, the entire business of our discipleship to Christ, the faith in that sense. He's not using it like Jude does in Jude 3, that you are to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Or as Paul would write in 1 Corinthians 15, I, I write to you about that gospel which you have received. He's not talking about faith in the sense of the gospel, the system. But by faith he means one's conviction or that is confidence on a particular issue. Because it's clear through here, it's not that, now here's this brother who's kind of wobbly in his faith and he's uncertain about whether he believes in God or, or whether he's really committed to Christ. He's not talking about that. He's talking about brothers in Christ who on a particular issue might lack conviction or confidence on that. And he mentions weak and strong. Weak and strong does not mean a weak or strong Christian overall, but weak or strong in relation to that particular issue. It might be that on a particular question, we've got two brothers in Christ. And one brother is strong on that issue, one brother is weak in that issue. But on another issue, the roles might be reversed and might be flipped. So that's the kind of distinction we need to make here in this chapter. So what are the kinds of issues? What are the kinds of things that he is addressing here? 
The kinds of issues, the kinds of disagreements he is talking about are disputes over things like, if you look in, in, in verse 2, one believes he may eat all things, but one, he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. And let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received him. Look on down to verse 5. One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. That is, have faith. Have that assurance in his own mind. Verse 6. He who observes the day, observes it to the Lord. And he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord. For he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat, to the Lord he does not eat. And gives God thanks. The the point being made there in in verse 6 is... If you observe a day like the Sabbath or like a new moon for a Jew that just conscientiously, you've got to do it. Well, he's doing it out of loyalty to God. And the Gentile, for example, who might not observe the Sabbath, he is still not observing it and he is still ordering his life just as much as the Jew is out of devotion to God. You see the point being made there? They're both committed. They're both men of faith. Uh, One does it because he believes that is what he must do, and the other refrains, yet his life is still ordered by devotion to God. And so here we've got disputes over things like the diet, question about observance of certain days as holy. So the issues discussed in Romans 14 are issues on which God accepts me whether I do it or not. And I have to say that again because it is so important and crucial. The issues in this chapter are things that God accepts me whether I do them or not. We might call them, therefore, matters of indifference or non-essentials. Now, they are non-essential and they are matters of indifference from God's perspective and from the perspective of the strong brother. The weak brother does not view it that way. But the chapter is not actually directed toward the weak brother so much as the strong one. And we get ourselves wrapped all around the axle if we forget that very thing. What does he say there in verse 1? Receive one who is weak in the faith. So he's talking to the strong ones. And yes, there are, are some times where he will address both on working with each other. But this chapter is about matters of indifference or non-essentials. The doubtful things like diet or observance of the holy days is an example of what he's talking about here. So then, let's go on and look a little bit more in depth to what this chapter is teaching. Look on then down to verse 7. What he's making the point in this first half of the chapter is, you have liberties and you have freedoms. You know, whether you eat pork or not, God doesn't care. Eat pork, he accepts you. If you refrain from eating pork, he accepts you all the same. God's indifferent. That's a non-essential to our relationship with God. And so what he is saying is some get that. Some brethren understand that fact, some don't. So if you understand the truth on that matter, you have liberty, you have freedom, but don't impose that liberty or freedom on your brother or sister in Christ who doesn't understand that. Keep on reading now with me in verse 7. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. So the point he's making there is, whether you have a a conscience about this matter or not, whatever you're doing, we're all here on the same team doing it out of devotion to God. And so remember that, strong Christian. Your brother who may not understand the truth on what God's will is on a particular matter, they are doing that because they're concerned about pleasing their God. You are too. Have patience with them. Understand that. And don't just run roughshod over them in their conscience in that. You're both trying to serve the same God. So he continues in verse 12. Sorry, verse 10. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? The idea there is showing contempt of, (laughs) you observe the Sabbath day. Everyone knows that the Sabbath has been done away with in terms of its binding nature on us. 
why are you doing that? Why don't you come over and let's just go on a trip together just to prove to you. He says, you are, in a sense, judging your brother. And you are lording it over him. And you're showing contempt. And so he says, remember, strong Christian, here in the middle of verse 10. For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, each of us shall give account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this. Not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. The prohibition on judging here is most certainly not the idea that we should not discern that some Christians are weaker or stronger. Some Christians have knowledge on a particular issue and some do not. Some Christians might need to be rebuked, reproved, or uplifted. He's not saying don't use the judgment in that sense. Other scriptures take care of that. What he is saying here is as he goes on to explain, you in a sense are being con the convictor. You, <clears throat> you are being the judge of your brother if you put a stumbling block in their conscience way. So then, in the rest of this chapter, he is impressing upon us that the key to unity is to see our brethren as God sees them. Look on down to verse 14. I know and am convinced... By the Lord Jesus, that there's nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him, it is unclean. Can we unpack that for a moment? In, again, using the example of the meat, Paul says, I know, I am convinced, not because, you know, that's just why, how it seems to me, but no, revelation of God has confirmed it. There is nothing that is clean or unclean in terms of food. However, Paul says, if you've got a Christian who considers something to be unclean, guess what? For him, it is unclean. And so he goes on to explain in verse 15. Yet if your brother is grieved, that he's there is troubled, his conscience is, is touched or pricked, because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Oh, that is such a sledgehammer of words and teaching that Paul levels against us. I have rights. I've got freedoms. I've got license to do a number of things where God says you could do it or not do it. I have not expressed my will on that. I accept you regardless. Paul says if you insist on your rights and you hurt the conscience of your brother, you have destroyed the one Christ came to die for. And that's not walking in love. In verse 16 then, Therefore do not let your good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The point he's making here is not that, you know, a little bit of scruple and fine detail and just being legalistic about things. You know, don't worry about that. Worry about the big things. It's not the point he's making. I think it's rather similar and akin to what Jesus taught us in Matthew 23 and verse 23. To the Pharisees, you tithe mint, anise, and cumin, and you have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Meaning that, yes, we need to understand the details matter, but if we lose sight of the big things, the weightier matters of the law, then we are liable to sin against our brother and sister in Christ. So in verse 19, Therefore let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. It is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. Do you have faith? And again, remember, I think in the context here, it's not, you know, do I believe in God or not? No, it's, do you have confidence and the assurance of knowing the truth on whatever particular issue is a point of disagreement? Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself and what he approves, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats 
because he does not eat from faith, meaning he does not have conviction and confidence if he's broken his conscience in that. That is to say, if, if you make and just really force and put pressure on a Jew and fine, I'll, I'll, I'll eat the pork, whatever. And he does it and he really thinks to himself, I shouldn't have done that. Or if you are sitting down to a meal at a, maybe a guest house and you've got your Gentile brother in Christ next to you and they start serving the meat and you're getting ready to carve it up and enjoy and this brother says, this was sacrificed to an idol. You know, this was sacrificed to an idol. We can't eat this. You can't say, Psh, don't you understand? I, we, we can eat this. What's wrong with you? And so he kind of sheepishly goes about and he eats it himself and later he thinks, I'm slipping back into idolatry because of that. If that's his mindset and he has broken his conscience, he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. It's important to recognize this distinction. My conscience does not justify me. Just because my conscience leads me to do something does not mean that that is right. So my conscience can't justify or approve me. Like Paul said, even to the Jews, I've lived before God in all good conscience to this day, but he was wrong about Jesus Christ until he saw him on the road and was converted. My conscience does not approve me. i got to get it right. On the other hand, breaking my conscience can condemn me. And the reason is, our conscience, the idea of I have a sense, I have been programmed to discern between right and wrong, and if I get into the business and the practice of just running roughshod over my own conscience and doing things even though I, I shouldn't do that, that's not right. And if I begin to do that, the Lord here is teaching, you're sinning. And I think part of the sin and the danger in that is that now is now conditioning me to disregard my God-trained uh, conscience in other matters. So if I don't eat from confidence and assurance, I eat in sin. And the whole point of this chapter then is in, or this section is in chapter 15 and verse 1. As Alden read for us a few minutes before. We then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good leading to edification. For, not, for even Christ did not please himself. But as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. It always goes back to Christ as our example. Because he had liberties. He had rights. He had freedoms. And for our sakes, he laid it aside. And became obedient to the point of death. Even the death of a cross. So, what are disagreements not covered by Romans 14? Matters of salvation. Whether one must be baptized for the remission of sins to be saved or not, we disagree about that. Now, I might understand, yes, what the Bible says, but maybe this other believer over here does not quite get the thing about baptism. We can just come together, and I'm not going to push you and run roughshod over your conscience there. No, that is not an issue this chapter is talking about. The people in this chapter, strong or weak, they are all Ones whom God has accepted. How can I say God has accepted someone when the Lord has said, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe shall be condemned. I don't have the right now to come along and say, Yeah, yeah, I know God said that, but I will accept you as a brother in Christ. That's not what this chapter is talking about. That's not an issue that this chapter is addressing. Matters of worship. Uh, whether we can use instrumental music in worship or not. That is not an object of debate in this chapter. It's not an issue that you say, you know, my, my brother over there, you know, likes instruments or doesn't like instruments. And so I'm just going to kind of, we'll work together over that. God has said, and he has given us instructions on the worship he wants by way of music. It is seen. And he very conspicuously left out any suggestion about bringing instruments into it. That is not a matter this chapter is discussing. Qualifications of elders. I put this in here because I got something very wrong last week. And that's one of the reasons for this lesson. Remember I said that on the question of an elder's children, um, you know, if, if there's disagreement, well, let's just invoke Romans 14 and work it out. I need to correct that error. 
I'm sorry, that's wrong. That is not an issue that this chapter talks about. God has expressed his will. We need to figure out what God has expressed and study together and come to agreement that way like on these other issues. So that is not something that this chapter is talking about, and I want to be very clear on that. It's not on whether a church can compromise on the qualifications of elders or not. Like I said, no one mentioned anything to me, but I really want to make sure we get that right. It's not discussed here. You know, another question or issue, matters of divorce and remarriage. Whether Christians divorced for a cause other than adultery. Can remarry and remain in good standing and fellowship in the local church? God has expressed his will on that. There is sin involved in some of these situations with, in terms of divorce and, and remarriage. And there is sin involved if someone remarries and they don't have a right to. That's not what this chapter is talking about. This is not someone that God has already accepted. The role of the Holy Spirit. Whether a preacher who teaches error on the role of the Holy Spirit is to be accepted or not. You know, these are not matters of indifference. These are not non-essentials to God. These and others are matters of eternal consequence. This chapter is not teaching any disagreement, any parting of the ways. We just need to come together and work together and overlook some of that. That's not the spirit of this chapter or the rest of the teaching in the New Testament. We are to study to understand God's will and then go do it. On these and other issues where God has said, this is what I want. Can I look at just a couple of passages to really emphasize the point we're making here? Go over to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. In verse 13, Paul wrote, Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me and faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. As Paul writes here to Timothy and throughout these letters, Paul says, Timothy, there are matters of eternal salvation. You are not to compromise. You are not to say, yeah, we disagree, but that's all right. We'll just kumbaya and be fine. He says, no, get it right. Teach the truth. Hold the pattern of sound words. Look over also to 2 John, the letter of 2 John. 2 John and verse 9. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. Now, the doctrine of Christ... You mean to tell me that the only thing that we're to be concerned about here is whether or not Jesus is divine? It's whatever Christ has taught, whatever his apostles have revealed, that is the doctrine of our God. And if I do not abide or stay with that doctrine, I do not have God. If I abide in the doctrine, I have both the Father and the Son, but keep on reading in verse 10. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine... Do not receive him into your house, nor greet him, for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. All right, now Romans 14 says, receive. 2 John verse 10 says, do not receive. So what is the difference? Romans 14 is talking about things that whether I do them or not, whether I even understand it accurately or not, God has accepted me. Matters like food and observance of holidays, that sort of thing. On the other hand, 2 John 10 is talking about matters where God has expressed his will and he has expectations for mankind. That is something I am not. It's, it's not my church. It's not my fellowship. It's the fellowship of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. And I am to be jealous for that cause. It's about walking in love. My freedom, my rights, my liberties can never stress my relationship with others in Christ and trouble their conscience. There are some situations in which I might know that a particular activity 
a state of affairs or a decision is perfectly fine. And God accepts me what, the same whether I do it or not. Can I give you an example of that? What if it's a Sunday afternoon and I think to myself, you know, look, I've, I've got a good chunk of time here before I'm called elsewhere to services. That yard is looking rough. Let me get out there and knock that out real quick before the, 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 day, uh, the, the week starts. You get out and you mow your yard, all right? What if then you arrive at services in the evening and dear brother so-and-so says to you, um, what are you doing? I saw you out mowing your yard. This is the Lord's day. And in this brother's mind, that's just, you, you can't do that. And, there, and this brother might be, again, wrongly, but importing a little bit of a Sabbath law into his way of viewing the Lord's Day and Sunday. He said, you, you really should not be doing that. Now, I've got a decision to make. Has God expressed his will on that matter for me and have expectations for me? Here's the litmus test. If I do it, does God accept me? If I do not do it, does he accept me the same? Yes. That's fine. If I mow my yard on Sunday afternoon, I'm not missing services. I'm not sinning in any kind of way. It's, it's, I'm doing it. All right, that's fine. God has not expressed his will. But if a brother in Christ that troubles him, he thinks that I may be desecrating this day, now, could we have a conversation? Could we study? Could we discuss the issue? What if that doesn't go anywhere? You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to stay inside the house and not mow on Sundays. Because it's not worth it. Is my grass worth destroying my brother for whom Christ died? And if that then, the idea of this chapter is what if that might lead him to say, you know, maybe there's some things I could do on Sunday. And if it bothers his conscience and he feels irreverent toward God, I've sinned against him and he's sinned. That's what this chapter is talking about. These are the kinds of matters where God accepts me whether I do it or not. If on some particular holiday, like a Halloween or like the secular observance of Christmas, where this just we're, we're having fun, we're getting together, we're not getting into the occult, we're not worshiping any kind of these fertility pagan gods of, of years gone by, it's just a secular observance, we're having fun, we're just enjoying time together and good food and sweets. And yet, maybe if there's a brother who thinks that that's just that's wrong, maybe they have a Catholic background, or maybe. They have a background from another country and they come and they observe this and they don't see the distinction. Am I then going to flaunt my observance of these days or invite them over to a party which I know is going to trouble them? If I'm aware of that and that information comes to me, it's not worth it. Is dressing up, is exchanging gifts in any kind of way or doing these things worth destroying a brother? If I become aware of that, I need to understand my brother is worth more than these things that I could take or leave. That God has not expressed his will that he accepts me or not based on that. And so these are the kinds of things I need to understand. This chapter is talking about. I'm to treat my brethren with respect and realize that my freedom or rights or liberties are not as valuable as my relationship with them and God's investment in them through the cross. The point of this chapter, I think, ultimately is remember the identity of our brethren. How does Paul describe your brothers and sisters in Christ in this chapter? In verse 3, he says, this is someone God has received. If God has received him or her, who am I by my actions to build a wall between me and them? This is God's servant, according to verse 4. I am not to judge, I am not to set aside a servant of another. Other Christians, you don't work for me, and I don't work for you. We work for our God, and we need to be aware of that in treating each other with love. He says, this is your brother. Don't forget, you are akin by the spiritual heritage and spiritual genes of your God in heaven. Don't forget you share that. This is also one for whom Christ died. If Christ died for them... How can I neglect them and not be concerned or sensitive to their feelings, to their conscience? And finally, in verse 20, he says, don't destroy the work of God. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And just like we all would be upset if we were working on a home construction project or a gardening project project, 
or a larger industrial project and we wake up in the morning to find that some vandal has destroyed it. None of us would be very happy about that. God, I don't believe, is very happy when we are willing to destroy his work, his project, just because I have the right to do it or to be involved in it. I want to close by looking a little bit further in the context to chapter 15 and read with you verses 5 and 7 before we close this evening. In Romans 15 and verse 5, Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, receive one another, just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. The powerful thing behind this chapter and what our invitation and appeal is to all of us is to remember ultimately what did God do for you? You know, what has God done for me? And what we are reminded of in this passage is that however strong I think I am, however convicted I think I am, however much progress I've made, it is all to the glory and to the praise of our God. And it is His fellowship, His church, His family, and we are brethren. And may we remember that fact. This evening, if you want to become a part of that family, and you've been thinking about that decision, now's the time to act on it. If you would come in faith, turning from sin in your former way of life, if you would confess Christ as your Lord and your Master, you can die with Him this evening in baptism and be raised to walk in newness of life. But also, Christian, if you realize that you've sinned against a brother or sister in Christ, if you realize that you stand in need of forgiveness from the Lord, confess and pray that the Lord would grant you that forgiveness. And for all of us in here, may we all recommit our zeal our dedication to our God who has given us everything. And if we can encourage you or help you in obeying the gospel, making our heart right with God, please come up to the front while we stand, while we're led in the song.